Welcome everyone to this Media One Public Affairs presentation entitled World Focus. On this edition of World Focus, we will feature the Green Party of California, the California Green Party. We're going to be talking to uh, the gentleman who is running for governor in 1998 on the Green Party ticket. And we'll also talk to a current Santa Monica City Councilman who is also a member of the California Green Party. I'm very pleased to welcome to this edition of World Focus, Mr. Michael Feinstein. Uh, Mike Feinstein might uh, uh, be familiar to some of our viewers as he has done many programs out of this cable facility in the past, but now we're very pleased to welcome Mike back to our studios as a councilman from the city of Santa Monica. Thanks, Ken. In addition to Michael Feinstein, I'm very, very pleased to welcome the candidate for governor on the Green Party ticket here in the state of California. That is Mr. Dan Hamburg. Of course, we'll be talking to Mr. Hamburg about his candidacy, what kind of a campaign he will run, and what kind of a governor he might turn out to be. Gentlemen, welcome to our Media One studios. Thank Michael, you. let me begin with yourself. It's uh, been a while since we've had a chance to talk. It's certainly a pleasure to have you back as a, as a Santa Monica City Councilman. We want to talk about that. But first, uh, let's talk about the state of the Green Party in California as a whole. How is it doing? Well, first, Gary, I want to say thanks for having me back and thanks for your commitment to public affairs programming. I wish we had more media that was really committed to getting out what's really going on. Thank so, you very much. Um, California Greens in 1996 had a record year. We won, uh, as part of overall, nationwide, we won 16 races. We won nine of them here in California. Five were city council races. So currently, we have 22 people elected to municipal office, nine city councils. In Arcata, we had two seats that we picked up, giving us three out of the five, the first green city council majority in the history of the country. My winning in Santa Monica was the largest city we won in, in the country and the first major media center. Donna Spring in Berkeley was re-elected for the third time. So piece after piece has been working for us. And what it's telling us is that where we're running on a local level, where we have a chance to communicate our message of ecology, social justice, grassroots democracy, and nonviolence, people are willing to vote for it. And we're winning. Uh, Dan Hamburg, you are formerly a United States congressperson uh, from the state of California. You were a Democrat at the time. Mm -hmm. You are now running for governor as a Green uh, Party member. Why did you switch party affiliation, sir? Well, I was a, a pretty much a lifelong Democrat. I was raised in a Democratic Party family. Uh, I remember my parents hustling for Adlai Stevenson in the 50s, and I, I certainly grew up with the Democratic Party kind of in my blood. Um, when I decided to run for Congress in 1992, I mean, there was not a lot of question in my mind, although people um, who were in more progressive parties, Peace and Freedom Green Party, urged me to run uh, you know, with their, their parties, but uh, both because of my lifelong ties to the Democratic Party and also because I wanted to win the election, I ran as a Democrat. Um, in 92, I was part of a very large freshman Democratic class. Also, after 12 years of Republican presidents, Bill Clinton and Al Gore went into the White House. And there was this, at least among my Democratic colleagues, and especially the ones who came in, the 63 freshman Democrats, there was this great surge of optimism and of feeling that, yes, the system can work. We can start moving things in a more progressive direction. Bill Clinton will help lead us there. And even if we knew from Clinton's uh, governorship in Arkansas that he was not quite a progressive, uh, many of us let ourselves believe that this was moving us forward, especially again after Reagan and Bush. Now, um, when I decided to leave the Democratic Party it was actually in 1996. And it was, uh, by that time, I was, I was out of Congress. I lost the election of 1994 in that great Gingrich sweep, but didn't really have major intentions to leave the party. Uh, I think it was really Nader's candidacy and my friendship with Ralph Nader that, uh, that sort of edged me that way, along with uh, the disaffection I felt from many of the policies and programs of the Democratic Party. And certainly a piece of that um, is something I had a chance to write about in The Nation and in Harper's recently, is the whole system of campaign finance and the whole degree to which uh, large corporations have become more powerful than nation states, including in this country. Okay. 
Uh, Michael Feinstein, you for, for many, many, many years had been a, a green activist here in Southern California, throughout the state, globally for that matter. I know you uh, talk regularly on your home computer to the Greens in Europe. You've been there. You've looked at their situation. You've written books about it. Uh, for a long time, many of us were uh, urging you to run for public office. You decided to do so. Um, how, how did you come about to finally make that decision? And uh, what was the race, the campaign like to, to become a city Monica, uh, a Santa Monica yeah. city council person? Well, you know, interestingly, uh, Dan's experience in D.C. kind of turned him, seeing that he tried to work within the system, within the Democrats, it didn't work. For me, I was trying to work as a citizen activist in Santa Monica and found that we were getting crushed by some of the large developer interests. At that point, I realized being on the outside shouting in isn't enough and that I had to go ahead and run. Had a grassroots coalition of the local tenants union called Santa Monica and Surrender's Rights, the local hotel and restaurant employees, Local 814. I had the support of local labor, of course, the Green Party, the neighborhood activist movement, etc. So we had a very broad coalition of progressive interests that walked door to door. I campaigned honest, positive message. I didn't cut down everybody else. I talked about what is a sustainable development in the community and how do we take grassroots democracy to give regular residents a chance to have a say over their own lives? How do we make that come into practice in the community? And there were 13 candidates for four seats. I finished with the second most votes overall, which was uh, pretty strong for a first-time candidate. Kind of shocking for yourself, It Michael? was shocking. I had a good faith in our message. I thought maybe I would squeak in as the fourth candidate that won. Taking away the absentee votes, which were cast early, and people who had a lot of money to mail to them, I actually finished first overall, which now says that people really do believe in this stuff. There's very validating process when in a mainstream election your ideas come through like this. Your association with Ralph Nader when he ran for president in 1996, um, every time I saw Ralph Nader on the news, uh, you were right at his elbow. How, how did that factor into you not only running for the council in Santa Monica, but winning a seat? Well, one of the reasons Nader chose the Green Party is because of our commitment to democratic process. He really believes in a civic culture. I had a mail piece in Santa Monica of Nader endorsing me along those lines. So the whole thing that I ran on about citizen involvement played in very well with Ralph and also the fact just of the credibility of the Greens as an alternative to the Democrats that somebody of his stature was going to come on board with us I think helped me locally. Uh, Dan Hamburg, uh, um, what, what is the difference sir between a liberal Democrat and a Green Party member? Well, I assume you uh, have been both. <clears throat> I have been both, um, although I, I always cringed a little bit at the liberal label, not because liberal has been, that idea has been kind of trashed in the media and during this kind of conservative wave, but also because um, it connotes a, uh, a belief that through a kind of incremental change of the current system that we can get where we need to go in order to uh, have a sustainable economy, in order to uh, have a society where most people can uh, live comfortably and nurture their children and own a home and, and attend good schools and all those kind of things. Um, I think that we are not in a situation now where the kind of slow incremental change that liberal Democrats, even liberal Democrats that I admire as much, say, as, as a Henry Waxman, you know, here in L.A., a good liberal Democrat, you know, um, certainly, you know, stands for many of the values I believe in. But being within that system, he and other liberals buy into the idea that we can kind of you know, tinker here on this edge and on this edge and come up with a much more viable society. Uh, I think progressives, Greens, tend to believe that we need some, somewhat more fundamental changes in the system. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're, uh, we're into a socialist ideology. It doesn't mean that we have any particular ism that we subscribe to. But we do think that the power relationships in the society have to be fundamentally changed. When you have a situation where the top 1% of the, of the income or the, the wealth uh, distribution in the country controls more wealth than the bottom 90 percent. You have a, a situation where democracy not only can't thrive, I'm not even sure that it really can exist. And of course, 
uh, your candidacy for governor uh, is already kicking off with the election only uh, a year away. What kind of a campaign, Dan, do you plan to run to uh, become governor of the state of California? Well, right now we're in an exploratory phase. Uh, just like uh, Al Chechi you know, and some of these other people. Um, John Vasconcellos, I recently heard, announced an exploratory committee. So we're, we're in that phase. One of the things that, that I'm hoping we can do is come up with a slate of green candidates that uh, represent the ethnic diversity uh, as well as the geographical diversity of, of California. I don't think, uh, as a candidate for governor, um, I think you can really run yourself ragged and, be, and really have a very thin coverage of the state. So I'm hoping we can find, uh, that we will find four or five candidates who can uh, concentrate on particular messages that the Green Party want, wants to put out uh, and can also be well known in their own geographical area. And what I mean by particular messages, just let me give you an example. I think that one of the um, one of the real problems that we're suffering in society is the erosion of constitutional and civil rights, and that's been done in the name of the war on drugs, the war on terrorism, and so on and so forth. I would hope that our candidate for attorney general will take on that issue, will take on the Dan Lundgrens and, and that whole philosophy that the only way that we can deal with uh, unrest in our society is by ever-increasing punishments, by more death penalty, by those kinds of uh, those kinds of ideas which have proved to be non-starters. Dan touches upon a philosophy that you have promoted for a long time, Mike, and that is to have the Green Party not candidate-led, but to have the party lead the candidates. Um, why is that such an important part of the Green philosophy? As Greens, we try and practice what we preach. We're concerned, Dan's talking about the top 1% having as much wealth and power as the bottom 90%. Top-down societies, whether it's top-down corporations, whether it's top-down government, give us injustice and ecological collapse. So for us to have the message take the lead, to have the candidates represent that, represents the kind of bottom-up society that we really want. And one of the other things that we're going to try and accomplish with Dan's campaign is to raise the idea of electoral reform, specifically proportional representation, where a party gets 10% of the vote, it gets 10% of the seats, as a way to have an inclusive political system in a state that is as diverse as California. To not have a political system that brings that diversity together is a recipe for disaster and the kind of inequalities Dan's talking about. At, at this point in the Green Party's uh, young history, if you will, uh, do you believe that, that people are now starting to realize that the Green Party is not just an environmental party, but uh, a party for all of the other values that they stand for? One of the, the positive things with the fact that we've run local races and have elected 35 California Greens since we started in 1990 is that we now have people in office who are getting to apply the philosophy. In Santa Monica, an issue I'm working on right now is the First Amendment civil liberties rights of street performers as we try and regulate them on our Third Street promenade. I've taken the lead on the civil liberties side. Other council members have done similar things in other cities. So we're making the links between ecology, economy, civil liberties, etc., that we always talked about. So yeah, I definitely think that's the case. And also, you look at last year, uh, Winona LaDuke being our vice presidential candidate, I mean, a longtime social justice activist, it's coming together. And also, I think Dan? we have to look at the, uh, the importance of the native candidacy and really expanding the image of what the Green Party is all about. Because I think the typical image has been that the Green Party is a bunch of tree huggers. You know, it's, it's very much, you know, kind of environmental extremists, you know, right. don't want to, you know, use the resource of the planet and so on. Um, and I think having Ralph as our, as our national candidate really showed that uh, we are concerned about this issue of, of, of wealth and power and corporate power specifically, and looking at ways that through the kinds of uh, things Mike is talking about, through citizen action, citizen empowerment, that we can start to turn that around. Of course, one other factor I, I want to mention is the fact that we have um, 60 or so percent of the electorate that is not participating. Mm -hmm. And we Very feel that point. the Green Party yeah. can yeah. provide uh, a, a real alternative to Tweedledum and Tweedledee. In providing that alternative uh, and to reach the long-term goals of the Green Party, do you believe, Dan, that, that baby steps are required to do this? Or is there uh, uh, can you bite off a lot at a time? Mm -hmm. Or is this something that's well, going to take a long time? Yeah, I think sometimes you have to sacrifice the runner along from first to second. And then every once in a while, you've got to swing for the fence. And I, I don't think that it's necessarily one way or the other. I think what Mike's talking about is very important. In fact, 
uh, in Mendocino County, which is my home, uh, a Green is going to run for county supervisor and has an excellent chance, chance to win. And I think that's great. And I'm supporting his candidacy. And he's very grassroots oriented. That, and that's great. Uh, I also think it helps when a Ralph Nader steps forward and runs as a Green, or, or even when a Dan Hamburg, who is you know, a former elected representative on, on a couple of levels, uh, local level and, and federal level, steps up and says, you know, these are important things for us to talk about. This is what the Green Party stands for. And um, you know, whether we will try to get every vote we can get, whether we win or not, is not necessarily the measure of our success or failure. But you are running to win. Absolutely. But is it more important to run to have a discussion or to win, would you say, Mr. Hamburg? Uh, I think that you have to have a discussion in order to win. Because, you know, as you pointed out, there's still a lot of people uh, out there in the state who don't know what the Green Party is. I mean, you know, you can't do that in a single Nader campaign or a single Hamburg campaign. And Gary, what, Michael? what Mark says is different, I think, than a lot of the third parties that are trying to get off the ground are two things. One, we have a local strategy where we are running on a local level where we can win today. Second, we have the guts to run against the Democrats, not buy into the evil of two lessers argument. A, the new party, the Labor Party, for example, have been reluctant to run against the Democrats. In New Mexico, in May, in a special congressional election, we got 17% a record for U.S. Congress. We made the Democrat lose. In making the Democrat this lose... This is in New Mexico? In New Mexico, this okay. past May, in a special election for Bill Richardson's seat when he went on to the U.N. Right. It was a highly Democratic district. They didn't think they'd lose. 17%. 17 percent. Wow. We finished second in Santa Fe and Taos counties. We won many, many precincts in Santa Fe County. So what this is now making the Democrats in New Mexico do is starting to talk about electoral reform. And what we're going to try and do around the country is do this so that the Democrats are going to fear that we're going to knock them out so that they will start to support proportional representation to have the dialogue Dan is talking we have a rightful seat at the table. The current electoral system doesn't allow us to do it. They've been reluctant to give us a place. We're going to make them give us a place by knocking them out. When you think about Dan's race, the idea that it could be Diane Feinstein against Dan Lundgren, those are two Republicans anyway. Vote for a Green. Vote for your conscience. Try and advance your politics that you actually believe in instead of just what you fear. Well, let's talk about the Santa Monica City Council table that you now sit at. Um, uh, what is the makeup like up there and, and how much of a uh, impact as the only seated green do you want to have or do you think you can have? Our council is three, three, and one. Um, there's three uh, green and or liberal people, one person kind of in the center, three on a more conservative side, although of course what's conservative in Santa Monica may still be more liberal in, in another community. Um, I've gone with the idea that I'm going to treat my fellow council members as human beings. I'm not going to just fill up the airwaves with, with a bunch of rhetoric, but try and find workable policies. And the fact is, the general approach of sustainable development and open civic process, I'm winning on most of the votes. And we are increasing the outreach to our residents so they understand what their government is doing and trying to give them more voice. So I've been very happy thus far. I've been surprisingly successful. What is it like sitting on the Santa Monica City Council? I mean, it's great that, it's great that the Greens have a majority in Arcadia, but, but you're sitting on the Santa Monica yes. City Council, which is a huge, major city uh, in the nation, let alone sure. in the Los sure. Angeles area. You know, the, I know a lot of this is seen here in the South Bay area. Long Beach has a budget, I believe, of around $500 million with about a half a million people. Santa Monica only has 90,000 people. Our budget is $278 million. Wow. Clearly, it's a powerful city. I am reading the staff report, I'm doing the work, I'm asking community members across political lines questions before something comes to council. What it's showing is that Greens not only have these nice ideas about saving the world, but we can responsibly govern. And that's the opportunity that we have in Santa Monica with me being up there in a very high profile position. Uh, Dan, what will be the, the, the two or three most important issues uh, for you uh, when you get out there and start traveling the state and running for governor? Which issues will you find yourself speaking of most, do you believe? I think the issue that is uh, really the most fundamental is economic justice. And you know, that gets back to what I was you know, mentioning about distribution of wealth. Um, I think we are becoming more and more a society of, of haves and have-nots. When you look at the economic growth that's occurred over the last couple of decades, almost 100 percent of, uh, of that increase in wealth has gone to the top 20 percent. Uh, we have hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of workers in this country who have, who have left their, or been, been downsized out of their $20 an hour jobs with benefits to, uh, 
you know, to seven, eight, nine dollar an hour jobs with with uh, you know with little security. Um, we have a situation where um, uh, you know more and more people feel that this economy may work well for Wall Street investors. Uh, but does not work very well for them on a day-to-day -day level. So I think looking at, looking at the tax system will be part of it. Looking at um, corporate responsibility will be, be part of it. Um, and then the other side, I think, of the issue of, of, of economic justice and, and social justice is the environment. Because um, these issues are very closely linked. I think if we, if we look at our society as an, as an interdependent society where we need to, um, uh, where we really need to work together. We need to, to not uh, cast aside any part of our society and say that, you know, they are, they are useless. They are, some, they are appendages that we can cordon off and forget about. Um, that philosophy applied to the environment leads to the kind of, of uh, planetary deterioration that I think is the major threat to the survival of our species on the planet. So I think overall, um, what I would be advocating for is a, uh, is a philosophy that deals with these issues as kind of two sides of the, of the same coin. Michael, let's talk about the environment just for a moment. There seems to be a little bit of a backlash going on now, starting with the last couple of years, perhaps. People still appreciate the environment. They still want clean air and clean water, but they're not as adamant about it, it seems, as they used to be. An example is the weakening recently of the uh, California State Endangered Species Act. Um, how much does that concern you? Well, you know, it's interesting, Gary. When people are polled, do you call yourself an environmentalist? 70, 80, 85 percent happens. The government that weakens the Endangered Species Act, they're the ones who are hurting environmental legislation and the corporate media that is owned by companies that destroy the environment are the ones that don't tell us and the ones who make us think environmentalism is going down. The reason you have a Green Party is because you've got Clinton and Gore hurting the planet, not helping it. Al Gore's an environmentalist, I thought. Yeah, many of us thought that, but it really hasn't played out. He really hasn't taken the lead at all. Yeah, well, in 1992, we thought he wrote this great book called Earth in the Balance, and now many of us wonder if he ever even read the book because his policies seem so much out of line with that. And, you know, just looking at, at Dianne Feinstein, I mean, many people would look at Feinstein and Lundgren and think, okay, Feinstein's very sensitive to the environment, Lundgren isn't. But if you really look at what Dianne Feinstein is doing right now. I mean, talk about, the, talk about ESA, talk about um, the, the agreement she made on Headwaters Forest up in my part of the state, um, this current bill she's pushing, which is going to double logging in the northern Sierras. There is a, an insidious relationship between elected officials, particularly at the federal level, and their funders. And in, in this case, talking about Diane Feinstein and the timber industry, this is a very, very cozy and chummy relationship. And what it leads to is, is serious degradation of the environment and, and serious um, uh, building up of corporate profits. And of course, uh, uh, this particular race in 98, both your race for governor and, and the race for all of the candidates uh, statewide uh, as Greens uh, is how critical at this point. You're, you're, you've, the Green Party has become legitimate now. Uh, they have established several footholds. Uh, is the pressure on even more now, Michael? I think that at a time when the planet is in such crisis, we have to consider ourselves very lucky to be in a position to have the opportunity to further, I mean, the kind of pressure you're talking about is great. This is what we've been waiting for for years. The tabling, the standing on street corners, registering people to, to vote green, to register green. And by the way, I hope your listeners will, 1-800-345-VOTE, you can get a registration card sent to your house and, you know, register for the party of your choice. We hope green. So the pressure is there, but this is what we've been waiting for. And the thing that we're finding is as our message gets out there, people do want to support it. They're turned off. The big parties are doing our work for us by just being so lousy. Do you, do you feel that there's added pressure, Dan, uh, uh, in general, but more specifically uh, on your candidacy for governor? Well, I, I would agree with Mike that the pressure's really on. And one thing, one thing that Ralph Nader said that's really stuck with me, he said during his campaign, was that we are the last generation, or we're living in the last period, where we can accomplish so much and have to sacrifice so little comparatively. In other words, if we keep letting 
um, the environment deteriorate over the next 10, 20, 30 years, the price to be paid will be just that much greater. And, you know, I think one of the things that does set the Greens apart is this sense of, of, uh, of alarm at, at what is happening globally. And that alarm is really backed up by science. I mean, th these are the, uh, this is what the Nobel laureates are saying. This is what World Watch Institute is saying. This is what the UN is saying. This is what the British Panel on Sustainable Development is saying. These things are being said by our top scientists. Now, you know, theoretically, we are a culture that believes very much in, in scientific data and in fact. And of course, you're always going to have a John Sununu type who's going to stand up there and say, oh, global warming, that's ridiculous. But meanwhile, British Petroleum's, uh, you know, CEO is saying, yeah, global warming is a real problem, and we've got to address that. Or look at the major insurance companies in the country that are meeting with organizations like Rainforest Action Network and Greenpeace to talk about climate change because they're getting hit in their pocketbook. Exactly. And you know, Gary, the, the scientific community is validating the kind of concerns Greens have talked about. But when you're talking about our political potential, I do a lot of speaking at high schools, colleges. Younger people are so much more inclined to vote Green. In 94, in our gubernatorial race in New Mexico, we actually won the 18 to 29-year-old wow. group. group. Right. So the future is going to be green. We're building a base now. I think people are going to be very surprised over the years at how our results just continue to grow. And that 17% for Congress in New Mexico I mean, is evidence of that. Gentlemen, we are out of time. Michael Feinstein, Santa Monica City Councilman. Uh, Dan Hamburg, candidate for governor of the state of California. Green Party members, we hope to catch up with you on the campaign trail, Dan, and, and Michael, as the months and the election gets closer. And